Well, thank you very much, and thank you uh, all for staying here uh, uh, until the last moment of this summer school. So today, as uh, announced, I will be talking about some boundary layer methods. Okay, so I will start with, um, let's say, some motivation for uh, general motivation for these uh, uh, boundary layer techniques. So in all the, in many models that I presented, you had the following situation. Okay, you have uh, a differential operator. A epsilon, which can be linear or non-linear, it doesn't matter at this stage. Okay, let's say of order k. Uh, and uh, a solution of the PD, say A epsilon of U epsilon equals F epsilon in a domain omega, which is in Rn. Okay, so there might be some time dependence on A epsilon. Here I'm st stating something which is really very general. Okay. And assume that uh, you have the following property. If uh, U epsilon converges towards some U bar strongly and F epsilon converges towards some F bar strongly, then you have uh, the following PD. A bar of U bar equals F bar. Okay, where now A bar is a differential operator of order uh, less than uh, K minus one. Okay, so this is typically what I was looking at yesterday when I had, a, say, a diffusion equation for, uh, for U epsilon, and I had some uh, penalization operator with some constraint, which was of lower order, right? So yesterday, I was uh, looking at uh, equations in the whole space, and I introduced some filtering techniques and so on, but I didn't look at what ha was happening on the boundary. Here, I want to point out, point out the following difficulty. If you have uh, a change in the order of the operator between A epsilon and A bar, then generically, you cannot enforce the same number of boundary conditions on the boundary of omega, okay? And so, if you want to construct some approximate solution for U epsilon, it cannot just be U bar. You need to add some correctors that will uh, let's say, match the whole boundary condition satisfied by U epsilon on the boundary of omega, okay? So, uh, need for correctors. Uh, in the boundary, in the vicinity of the boundary. Okay, and these are precisely boundary layer correctors. So yesterday in his talk, Rupert introduced, uh, you know, he had this uh, time model, advection diffusion time model in which he constructed uh, a boundary layer corrector. This is typically what I will be doing again uh, today. Uh, and the goal is to, the, the, so the goal of the lecture is to introduce some uh, general methodology. Well, it's uh, not uh, one, it would be really. Uh, to construct boundary layers. So 
So let me right away uh, maybe uh, give you a few warnings. So the first one is that everything I will consider today will be uh, linear boundary layers, okay? for uh, operators A epsilon that are, okay, they might have a nonlinear part, but the boundary layer operator will be linear. And, uh, and the operators uh, A epsilon will have a constant coefficients. Okay, so it will really be for uh, a specific type of boundary layers, but which is quite uh, common in the framework of, uh, of fluid dynamics. So this was my uh, first warning. The second warning is that actually, here I'm saying that I will uh, introduce some uh, general methodology. Uh, in fact, so it's actually uh, a general method to construct things, but there is uh, very little general theory. Uh, uh, let me rephrase that. In most cases, you cannot apply a black box theorem stating that, okay, this is your operator, then you will have a boundary layer looking like this and you will have convergence, okay? You have to do a kind of case-by-case case construction and analysis. So this is one of the take-home messages. Uh, let me rephrase that again. For those of you who are familiar, say, with uh, homogenization theory, there is no equivalent uh, as of now of, let's say, uh, two-scale homogenization theory with uh, you know, some special test functions uh, that, are, uh, that have a, a special type of oscillations for boundary layer theory. So there have been uh, definitely some attempts in that uh, direction. So I will uh, quote, for instance, a paper by uh, David Jarvare and Thierry Paul, uh, which introduces precisely this uh, general methodology and uh, in which the, the authors give uh, a theorem of convergence in some, uh, let's say, uh, nice environments. But usually, you really have to do the case-by-case -case analysis, okay? And there was also some attempt to, uh, by Laure Saint-Raymond to, let's say, adapt the, uh, the idea of uh, oscillating test functions and of um, two-scale homogenization to, uh, to boundary layers. So there are still some things to do, even at a very uh, abstract level. Okay, um, so I will start with uh, an introduction to the, well, with, the, with the, the general methodology, and then I will give you some examples. Okay. So uh, let's say, uh, so assume uh, that we are in the following situation. situation. Okay, so let's say that A epsilon is linear. A epsilon has constant coefficients. And uh, the last assumption is that omega has a flat boundary. So let's say that omega is, say, Rn minus 1 cross R plus. Okay? And you want to investigate what happens in the vicinity of uh, the, the boundary here. Okay? So omega is the set X prime Xn with X prime in Rn minus 1 and Xn positive. So you want to study what happens in the vicinity of Xn equals zero, okay? And the idea is that since you have a flat boundary and uh, A epsilon has constant coefficients, essentially what you're going to do is symbolic analysis, okay? So in other words, you're going to look for modal solutions. So you look for uh, u epsilon. So u epsilon here might be a, a vector, okay? I'm not specifying anything about the dimension of u epsilon. And later on, I will study different types of problems 
in a, so I will first study a scalar problem just to give you a general flavor of the type of arguments, and then I will go into uh, vector problems. So you look for u epsilon in the form exponential i uh, psi prime scalar x prime. Okay, there might be a time variable in, in here that I'm not writing down, but uh, in uh, Rn minus one, you might have the time variable there. Um, so i x, uh, minus lambda xn minus one, xn, okay? Times some capital U epsilon. And this one is a, a complex vector. Okay, so you look for special solutions that look like that, special solutions of your equation, okay? And uh, you plug that into the equation. And what you obtain is a linear system, okay, because A epsilon is linear and has constant coefficients. So in fact, you have something that looks like A epsilon, which is a matrix depending on K and lambda. So this is matrix in general and a square matrix because a Usually you have the same number, as many equations as unknowns, okay? So we have a square system. Uh, apply to u epsilon, which is your vector, equals zero, okay? And in order to have a non-trivial solution of this system, you need the determinant of a epsilon to vanish. Okay, so this equation has a non-trivial solution. If and only if the determinant of A of epsilon of K prime and lambda equals zero. This here is a polynomial in K prime and lambda, okay? Why? Well, because uh, you're doing some Fourier analysis on some differential operators. All the coefficients of A epsilon are polynomials in K prime and lambda. And so what you have is a polynomial in the end. And so what you're doing is, and obviously this polynomial also depends on epsilon because it keeps the, dep the epsilon dependency of uh, the, your initial um, operator. So, <clears throat> What you're doing is you're going to solve this, uh, this polynomial, or at least you're going to try and find the uh, asymptotic laws for lambda in terms of uh, epsilon and k, uh, in k prime, as uh, epsilon goes to zero. Uh, sorry, if k prime is psi prime. Yeah, uh, Rupert is no longer here to correct my mistakes as I go, but please uh, interrupt me, okay? Uh, I will definitely uh, write some uh, wrong things on the blackboard, and if you feel that something is wrong, uh, you feel free to interrupt. Um, yes, so, again, you, you're looking for the roots of this equation, okay? You're only interested in roots that have a positive real part, because these roots will give you some decay far from the boundary. If you have a negative real part, then it will give you some kind of uh, uh, exponential growth far from the boundary, and this is typically something that you want to avoid if you are in the whole space, obviously. Okay, so you only keep the roots that have positive real parts, and if you are actually looking for a boundary layer, you even only keep the roots that have a very large positive real part, okay? Because this will give you uh, something that is uh, strongly decaying far from the boundary. Okay. Uh, okay, so I had a whole discussion with Claire as to how I should manage the blackboard. So, uh, uh, <laughs> wait a second. Because uh, the goal is to avoid some shadow as I'm writing things down. Uh, 
Yes, but then you cannot. Uh, okay, may let me invert this too. Ah, yes, this is better. Okay, so um, so you look at the set of lambdas such that the real part of lambda is positive and even greater than one, okay? And for each of these lambdas, um, you consider the associated vector u epsilon of uh, k prime and lambda, okay? And then you're going to look, let's say, at, uh, uh, let's say that you have a Dirichlet boundary condition for u epsilon on the boundary. Uh, on the boundary of omega, then the uh, quantity that you will be interested in is d, which is the dimension in, uh, in C of the vector space generated by the uh, u epsilon of k prime and lambda for uh, lambda, which is a root of uh, or lambda such that the determinant of A epsilon of xi prime xi prime and lambda equals zero, and let's say the real part of lambda greater than one. Okay? This quantity, this dimension d, tells you the number of boundary conditions that you will be able to lift thanks to the boundary layer, <coughs> okay? It means that if you, uh, let's say that you have, uh, for instance, three roots of your, uh, of your uh, uh, with uh, positive real part, this very large of your uh, polynomial here, okay? And let's say that each of these roots uh, generates a vector u epsilon, which is a solution of your uh, linear system. Okay, then if you make linear combinations of these three vectors associated with uh, their uh, exponential uh, blah, 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 associated with their phase, then you will be able to lift three boundary conditions on the boundary. Okay, so, uh, and this in turn tells you what type of uh, boundary conditions are admissible for the interior part of the solution, okay? There are all kinds of situations, and I will present uh, different situations in the, in the rest of the talk. You, you can have a system in which you are able, uh, the boundary layers are able to correct uh, all the boundary conditions on the boundary. So let's say that u epsilon uh, is a three value, then you are able to lift three boundary conditions. Then there is no condition for the interior part of your system. Okay, your boundary layer can uh, solve everything. You can also have a situation where your boundary layer cannot lift anything, and so you need the interior part of your system to vanish on the boundary, exactly, okay? And you can have all type of uh, intermediate situations, okay? Uh, maybe one uh, go-home message that we will also uh, apply in the, well, that we will illustrate in the rest of the lectures is that if this dimension is uh, lower than the total size of your system, so let's say that you have uh, three equations and d is equal to two, for instance, then generically what you have is uh, an influence of the boundary layer within the interior of the fluid, okay? Uh, either through the boundary conditions that the interior of the fluid needs to satisfy or through some additional uh, term, okay? So if 
d is strictly lower than the dimension of the system. And by dimension of the system, actually what I mean is uh, uh, rather the number of uh, boundary conditions satisfied by U epsilon. Uh, then there is some influence of the boundary layer in the interior part of, uh, the, of the solution. Okay. So I'm aware that this is very abstract, but I just wanted to give you a general uh, way of constructing things, and now I will do examples so that this uh, becomes a little more concrete. Okay, uh, just to give you some general references. So there is a paper by uh, Gérard Varet and Paul that I quite like, where they uh, really uh, push very far this uh, this uh, strategy, uh, so I'm not uh, stating all the results they, they prove in this paper. Uh, um, we try to formalize this in a, in a way, uh, in a special case uh, with Laurent uh, Raymond as well, but this is also something that was uh, presented in the applied math or physical community, for instance, by uh, Van Dyck. Okay, and so now I will uh, look at some examples. Uh, and so if I want to avoid this shadow, I need to move this up. Okay. So I will start with a toy model. So example one. So it's a toy model. It's the stationary version of what uh, of what uh, Rupert presented yesterday. Okay. So let me look at the mo the following model. So I'm looking at minus epsilon u x x uh, plus u x equals one in zero one with u at zero equals u at one equals zero. Okay. So it's really like the uh, uh, direction problem that he presented yesterday, except that I have no time variable here. So obviously, uh, you can compute an explicit solution for this problem. So it's really, uh, but, but I don't care about that right now, okay? The goal is really to uh, explain to you, uh, to illustrate the type of techniques that I just introduced. So I, I, I won't write down the explicit solution, okay? The goal is to understand how the boundary layers can be constructed. So first, uh, this is an elliptic equation. You can apply the lax milgram theorem and find, uh, prove that there exists a unique solution in H1, in H10, actually. Um, you can first try and find a priori estimates just by multiplying uh, the list by U, but actually this gives you a rather poor control of your solution. And it's a little more clever to uh, multiply by U times some weight function. Okay, and if your weight function has nice properties, and in the present case, so it needs to be uh, non-vanishing and decreasing. So for instance, you can take exponential minus x. Okay, uh, nice weight function that is positive and, uh, and, uh, and non-increasing. Then you can prove that actually uh, you uh, satisfy some bounds. So I will write that down as a lemma, and I can li I leave it as an exercise. Um, so there exists, so this is time model, uh, there exists a unique solution u epsilon in H10 uh, of 0, 1 of the time model, satisfying the following bounds. So you have epsilon u dx u epsilon square in L2 plus u epsilon L2 square, which is bounded, okay, uniformly in epsilon. So here, the important thing is that you have a bounded L2 norm, 
Okay? And so uh, you multiply by u epsilon times exponential minus x. Okay, okay so since you know that uh, you have a bounded uh, solution, at least in L2, for this problem, you can pass to the weak limit. You know that u epsilon weakly converges towards some u bar in uh, L2, okay, up to a subsequence, and u bar must satisfy u bar x equals one, okay? So pass to the limit in the sense of distributions. So obviously, uh, you could enforce two boundary conditions for u here, at both on the left and on the right, but you cannot do that for u bar. Either you assume that u bar vanishes on the left or it vanishes on the right, but you cannot assume both, okay? Because uh, it's, a, it's a linear function, okay? So you have some boundary layers, either on the left or on the right or on both sides, and you want to find what are the boundary layer solutions. So you uh, apply the methodology presented in the first paragraph. Okay, and so uh, I will separate the cases close to x equals zero and close to x equals one. So close to x equals zero. So in that case, obviously, it's very simple because it's a, it's a scalar problem, it's a 1D problem, so you have no Fourier variable or anything. So you look for solutions of the homogeneous equation. in the form of an exponential. So exponential minus lambda x, okay? And you want to find what lambda is. So it's really uh, most uh, trivial in that case. Uh, so it gives you the equation on lambda is minus epsilon lambda square minus lambda equals zero, okay? You plug that into your equation and you find this. And so you find that lambda equals uh, minus one over epsilon. Okay, so it's negative, and this is not admissible. Okay, so in that case, actually, you have d equals zero close to x equals zero. You can lift no boundary condition. Uh, so let's say d is zero, which is the dimension associated to the boundary on the left, is zero. You cannot lift any boundary condition. Okay? And now let's do the same thing close to x equals one. So close to x equals one. You look for solutions of the form exponential minus lambda times one minus x, which is the distance to the boundary. Okay, so that this is always a positive quantity. And now when you plug that into your equation, what you find is minus epsilon lambda square plus lambda, this time equals zero. So this tells you that lambda be one over epsilon. Okay, I'm just always discarding the value lambda equals zero, which would correspond to a constant state. So now you are very happy because this is positive. It's uh, very large. Okay, so it tells you that you have a boundary layer of size one over epsilon. Okay? Okay, so uh, as a consequence, your solution, you, so you can lift uh, a boundary condition in the vicinity 
of x equals 1. Okay. And so you, then you can write an asymptotic expansion for your solution, but this is not uh, what I want to do now. And so what you find is that uh, the good uh, limit system for u bar is, so u bar x equals one, and u bar at x equals zero equals zero, because this is the point where you cannot lift anything. And so at x equals one, you will have a trace for u bar, which you will then lift, thanks to a boundary layer. Okay. Um, okay. So, I, I won't compute the uh, approximate solution or anything uh, in, uh, for, for this model. Uh, let me just uh, make a few comments. So, it might seem a bit academic somehow, but in fact, this toy model is quite close to uh, a model that is used in uh, oceanographic models, which is called the Sverdrup or the Monk model, and um, which is a uh, a uh, good modelization for uh, currents close to, close to coasts. So the model, for instance, the, in, in its uh, simplest form, so uh, a more refined version of this toy model is uh, dt, uh, yeah, so maybe I can uh, not know this, dx u epsilon minus epsilon uh, square of u epsilon equals some forcing uh, f, okay? And this is in omega, where omega is in the domain in R2. And what you enforce as conditions on the boundary is u epsilon on the boundary is zero, and dn u epsilon on the boundary is also zero, okay? Here you have an operator of order four, so you are allowed to assume that you have these two conditions, okay? So you can see that except for the fact that here you have a bi-Laplacian and here I had uh, just one Laplacian. Uh, these two models have some uh, similarity. And uh, when you look at the boundary layers for this model, so the, the analysis is a bit uh, complicated, but if you are at least, uh, if omega is like a, a rectangle, it becomes uh, slightly simpler. And what you can prove is that uh, in that case, it's uh, the reverse case, you have no boundary layers uh, close to x equals one, but you have boundary layers close to x equals zero. And these boundary layers give you a very strong gradient for u epsilon, okay? And this uh, strong gradient describes some very intense currents. And this is something that you actually observe in the ocean. In the ocean, you have very strong currents close to western boundaries. And when I say western, it's from the point of view of the ocean, so okay, if you're looking at an ocean, it's the boundary that is uh, on the west, okay? So uh, it's the east coast if you're on the coast. So for instance, uh, if you look at the Gulf Stream close to the American coast, this is typically uh, a western current, okay? Uh, which is very intense and which is created by this type of phenomenon, of boundary layer phenomenon. It's the same thing, for instance, for the Kuroshio current close to Japan. So even though it's a rather simple model, which is linear and so on, it still gives you some insight as to what is going on uh, actually, okay? Um, okay, so this was just the first model to introduce the, or to illustrate the methodology. And now I will go into some more complex models. So, uh, what I wanted to do was to present several, uh, oh yes, there's something, there's something else I want to say. Uh, what I wanted to do today is to present different types of situations for boundary layers. So this one is a situation in which you have an interaction of the boundary layer with the, the interior flow through uh, this fact, through the fact that you cannot lift any boundary layer close to x equals zero, and therefore you have a, uh, uh, a condition for the interior flow here, okay? This is the first type of interaction between boundary layer and mean flow. Uh, now, in the second example, I will present a case in which 
the d uh, here is equal to the dimension of the system. And so there is no interaction, at least at the linear level, between the boundary layer and the mean flow. And then if I have time, I will present a third system, which is the Ekman layers, and in which it's a bit of a mixed situation. You have an interaction between the boundary layer and the mean flow because the boundary layer creates some source term within the mean flow. Okay, so you have different types of situation and it's hard to predict a priori which case you're going to be in. You ne really need to do that uh, symbolic analysis here. Okay? And the other thing that I wanted to say uh, was to make a connection with uh, Rupert's talk yesterday because you, as you could see, um, the way he presented it uh, was to, through the method of uh, matched asymptotics. Okay? So what he was doing is uh, construct a general solution for the uh, interior part, construct a general uh, solution close to the boundary, and match the two as you exit the boundary layer. Okay? Here, it's not exactly the same point of view. The matching that you're doing is actually on the boundary. You're saying, I'm constructing a mean flow. It has a trace on the boundary. And then I uh, lift this trace thanks to a boundary layer. Okay? So obviously, the two points of view are uh, equivalent in the end. But it's a slightly different way uh, of think, seeing things. But it's equivalent. Okay? It's, uh, it really depends on... Uh, whether you want to match things as you exit the boundary layer and whether you want to match things on the boundary. Okay. Uh, and yes, maybe let me emphasize that as long as you remain at a linear level, uh, you, you can really, uh, it's just a matter of subtracting the, the value of the boundary layer at infinity, okay? So it's really uh, unimportant. If you work with uh, nonlinear systems, you should be a bit careful because uh, uh, well, the nonlinearity might might cause some problems. You cannot just subtract any solution of the of the, the homogeneous system, okay? If you are nonlinear, the nonlinear case. Okay, so now let me go to my second example. Which is uh, the boundary layers for uh, a stratified fluid. Uh, in the critical reflection regime. Okay, so this is a recent work with uh, Roberta Bianchini and Laure Saint Raymond. Uh, following uh, a paper by uh, uh, Thierry Doxois, uh, so from Thierry Doxois and Bill Young. Okay, and also a number of uh, uh, experimental studies by uh, the group of Thierry Doxois in, uh, in ENS Lyon. Uh, so let me describe the, the, the system. So the system is the oberbeck businesque system that I already uh, talked a lot about. Uh, and so it, with the, in the following scaling. So you look at dt u epsilon plus, okay, I will put some small linearity uh, just to make the connection with our paper, but I really will not study today the influence of the nonlinearity. okay? I will just, just comment briefly on it. Uh, plus the gradient of some pressure term, minus new Laplacian of u epsilon equals minus rho, I'm um, denoting this by epsilon and there's no epsilon. So I have several small parameters here, minus rho E3 and dt rho plus delta u grad rho minus u3 minus kappa Laplace and rho equals zero. Okay, I'm going to look, look at a regime in which you have delta, nu, and kappa that are small. And in fact, I will, uh, you can take delta equals zero in uh, everything that I will be uh, talking about. 
uh, okay, and I will work in a domain that has the following form. So omega is the half plane over a sloping boundary. So you have an angle gamma here, okay? And omega is the set x1, x3, so it's a 2D domain, okay? I'm forgetting about one of the horizontal components and I will just, uh, it's typically the kind of thing where I'm sure that I will get it wrong if I, uh, if I try to do it from memory. So it's uh, x1, x2 in R2 minus x1 sine gamma plus x3 cos gamma positive, okay? So this is x1, this is x3, okay? So this is your fluid domain. You're looking at everything above a fluid domain. Oh, above a, excuse me, a sloping a slope. And the, uh, the motivation of uh, Doxois and Jung, so it was to, was to study uh, the reflection of internal waves uh, close to this type of sloping boundary, and in particular to study critical reflection regimes. And what they, uh, so at first they did some kind of uh, um, uh, theoretical prediction that was then uh, confirmed by uh, uh, simulations and also by uh, experimental observations. And so their question was the following. You send an incident wave or an incident wave packet onto this uh, sloping boundary and you so the incident wave packet is a solution of the linear system without any viscosity. Okay, so you can write down explicitly what it looks like. You have an explicit formula. And the question is, what is reflected, essentially? Okay, and they proved that in some, uh, or they, uh, at least they, they gave some uh, formal insight that at least in some regimes, uh, when the angle of the incident wave packet and the angle gamma are very close, uh, the reflected wave packet remains in a boundary layer, close to the boundary, okay? And then if you add the nonlinearity, they saw some kind of creation of harmonics and so on. Um, but so this is uh, what they wanted to, to, to study and this is what we, uh, we try to justify as well, okay? So uh, I won't write down what the incident wave packet looks like, and I will immediately go into uh, the general methodology that I presented. I need to leave this again. So the first thing that you need to do is slightly, well, not slightly, but change the, the frame of reference you're working with, because since you want to work with boundary layers, uh, you, it's useful to look at actually uh, the normal component to the boundary, okay? So I will write everything in terms of X, which is the uh, tangential component to the boundary, and Z, which is the normal component to the boundary. Okay, so you, uh, the study of the boundary layers goes as follows. You look for solutions of 
your system, uh, your Babak Business system, with, oh, and I didn't write down the boundary conditions, I'm sorry. So you have U on the boundary of omega, which needs to vanish, so it's a non-slip assumption, okay? And you assume that D, Z, rho, or D and rho, say, on the boundary of omega also vanishes, so no flux for the density or temperature on the boundary. Okay. Uh, so you look for solutions of the oberbeck business system of the following form. So you have U, uh, what I denoted by rho, and the pressure P. So this is a four-dimensional vector, okay? Because U has two components. So it's one, two, three, four, okay? And you look for it in the following way. So it, it's uh, exponential uh, I, so uh, Xi prime times, uh, or Xi uh, times uh, X minus omega T, because you have a time variable, okay? Minus lambda Z times some vector U, say R, uh, yes, so I don't want to say capital pi, okay? Where, so U R pi is some vector in C4, okay? Once again, you plug this into your system and it gives you a big matrix. So you obtain, I won't do the computations, you obtain a linear system of equations, which looks like, so capital A uh, of, uh, so it depends on uh, nu and kappa, of psi, omega, and lambda, applied to u, r, pi, equals zero. Okay, so maybe I can write down what the matrix A nu looks like, okay? Uh, it, it, well, it's not, very, uh, it's not very funny, but it's just to give you an idea of uh, how things go. Um, so it's minus I omega plus nu uh, xi square minus lambda square. So this is the time derivative, this is the diffusion. Okay, on the first component, zero minus sine gamma and ik, okay. Uh, zero minus i omega plus nu psi square minus lambda square minus cosine of gamma minus lambda, okay. This is the projection, these two terms come from the projection of E3 onto the basis uh, Ex Ez, okay? So this is where the, these two, this uh, sine and cosine come from, okay? They come from the uh, minus rho E3 uh, term in the right-hand side. This is the pressure, okay? Uh, and once again, I denoted K by Xi. Uh, then for the equation on uh, on row, you have the following thing. Plus kappa psi square minus lambda square zero. And then you have the divergence free condition, which is just this one. Okay, so it's a four by four matrix. So again, it's a, uh, it's maybe tedious, but it's not uh, theoretically complicated, okay? You just, uh, yes, you, you, you just uh, look for modal solutions of your linear system and uh, write down the whole linear system which is associated to that. Then you compute the determinant of that matrix. So I, then uh, for, for that, that I, I will not write down the exact expression because I'm not sure it's, uh, it will give you uh, uh, a lot of insight. So it's a polynomial, and it's a polynomial of order six in lambda, okay? For instance, if you look at the diagonal, you see that you have a 
lambda square, lambda square, lambda square. So this gives you an uh, order lambda six. Okay, so it's a polynomial of uh, degree six. Okay, so it has six complex roots. Six complex roots. And you can investigate the behavior of these roots, especially the ones with positive real part, as the parameters mu and kappa are small. Okay? And this will give you the type of boundary layers that you obtain. So this is what we did. And uh, it's this one first. <clears throat> and uh, I need uh, no, maybe I need to move this one up a bit. Okay. And in fact, when you study the behavior of the, um, of the roots, this is where you have some uh, critical parameter coming up. Okay, can everybody read the top word right there or? Uh, more or less, okay. Um, So again, I won't write down what the, uh, the polynomial looks like, but I will just write the, the theorem that we, the result that we obtained with uh, Roberta and Laure. So you assume that, okay, to simplify matters, I assume that nu and kappa are of the same order and that they are both uh, very small, and you introduce a criticality parameter, which I denote by zeta, which is omega square minus sine square of gamma. Okay, and this is what measures the angle. Uh, well, at least the difference in the angle between the incident wave packet and the and gamma. Okay, the incident wave packet has a, an incident angle, obviously, which is related to omega, and this is what measures the difference between the two angles. And we, uh, we have the following property. Okay, uh, I also assume to, that I'm uh, not in, a, in a looking at lo too low frequencies. Okay, then what uh, the first thing that we proved, or the first thing that is easy to see, is that P6 of lambda always has exactly uh, three roots with positive real part. And then you have uh, the roots have the following asymptotic behavior. Okay. So there are essentially uh, three cases depending on the value of the critical parameter relative to, uh, to, to nu. So if zeta is greater than one, then you have um, one root. Whoa, oh, so I'm always looking at uh, so my three roots with positive real part. Let me denote them lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, okay? You, you can actually, uh, there are a curve depending on mu, uh, on mu kappa, and, uh, and zeta. So I can look at the dependency of each of these, uh, of the, each of these uh, roots with respect to the parameters. So if zeta is uh, bounded away from zero, so this is the non-critical case, then lambda one behaves like uh, at main order, like some imaginary value, okay? It has a positive real part, but which is a flower order, 
which is small, okay? With mu naught, which is real. So this corresponds to a reflected wave. Okay, and then lambda two and lambda three are like new to the minus one half. Okay, so these are actual boundary layers. So in that case, you have one reflected wave, which is not trapped in the vicinity of the boundary, okay? That will uh, actually exit, go out in the domain, and two boundary layer solutions, okay? But these three values still allow you to lift three boundary conditions. One is handled by the reflected wave, and the other two are handled by the boundary layer. Then you have an intermediate regime in which you have zeta that is between nu to the one third and one. Okay, and in that case, you have different behaviors for each of the boundary layers. So lambda one, in that case, transitions between this uh, purely imaginary behavior at main order and a boundary layer behavior. So it behaves like I zeta to the minus one times mu, mu one, where mu one is again uh, uh, something that is uh, real valued, plus nu to the zeta four times mu two. So as you can see, depending on the value of this, you might either, either have a very large real part or not, okay? So you have a transition in the regimes, uh, so mu one and mu two are real valued, okay? So the size of the boundary layer associated with uh, lambda one is this, so, uh, and, and this might be either large or small. But you have a, okay, so when you look at the whole, of, uh, the whole uh, parameter uh, space, you have a transition in the behavior. And lambda two is like uh, zeta over nu, or nu over zeta to the one half, So this is large. And uh, lambda three is still new to the minus one half. Okay, and then the last regime is zeta, which is at most of order new to the one third. So this is the critical regime. Okay. And in that case, you have lambda one and lambda two, which behave like nu to the minus one third, and lambda three, which behaves like nu to the minus one half. Okay, so in that case, you have actually three boundary layers, okay? So in that case, you have a reflected wave and a superposition of two boundary layers. Here you have either two or three boundary layers. And here you have three boundary layers, okay? And as you can see, you have a transition between uh, the different regimes. Okay, so this table was uh, the reason for my remark in the first lecture when I was saying that in some cases, it might give you some insights to actually keep the whole parameters and do the complete analysis. Because actually, uh, in the paper by Doxua and Jung, they, uh, they focused immediately on the case when zeta is exactly like nu to the one third. And uh, to be honest, when you look at, the paper, at, uh, at that from the, the beginning, you have no idea why they're choosing such a scaling. It's really not obvious at all. And uh, I don't see any way to uh, have some kind of intuition why that would be true uh, apart from doing this analysis, okay? But uh, if you do the complete analysis, then you understand why this scaling plays a special role because it's the, the actual scaling in which you always have three boundary layers and so on. And by the way, they, they uh, hadn't uh, spotted this one, okay? They had. Uh, they had studied this boundary layer, but this one uh, is not present in their paper, and so they, um, to make things a bit simple, one way to see that is to say that uh, these two boundary layers 
handles the Dirichlet -like boundary condition, and the third one handles the no flux boundary condition for rho. It's not completely true, but it's true in first approximation, okay? And this is more or less the, uh, the, the condition that they take in the, in the limits for this, uh, for this boundary layer, okay? So, uh, the conclusion is that in that case, you can always lift three boundary condition. Three boundary conditions, okay? Lift three boundary conditions, okay? So obviously it might get messy, it might get technical, but you can do it. Okay, and, uh, and then if you want to construct an approximate solution, so I won't be doing that today, but what you have to do is the following. You first construct a solution of the implicit system, which is your incident wave or incident wave packet. Okay, then you construct the boundary layer associated with that. Okay, because your incident wave has a non-zero trace on the boundary. Okay, so you have three traits that you need to lift, one, two, and three here, but your boundary layer exactly allows you to lift these three traces, and so you're good. You construct the boundary layer, you just need to solve a linear uh, system, it's really linear algebra, okay? And, uh, and then you have your approximate solution, at least of the uh, linear system, okay? And then you might want to look at the influence of the nonlinearity. So I, I don't want to go too much into that today. Uh, let me just mention that as long as delta is small enough, the nonlinearity will not play any role in the construction of boundary layers, okay? It's like, a, it's a weakly nonlinear term if you want, okay? So what you can do is do the complete linear analysis and then handle your nonlinear remainder. And in your nonlinear remainder, you will have interactions between uh, the incident wave packets, between the boundary layers and so on. And this is precisely what will create harmonics. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to, to say much more about that, but you can have, uh, you can prove a theorem of convergence, so construct a whole approximate solution and uh, including the nonlinear term and then have a, a theorem of convergence in which you exhibit these second harmonics and so on. Well, not and so on, actually. You exhibit the second harmonics and then you stop because, uh, because it's already complicated and you don't know how to go one step further. So, not and so on. Uh, so I won't write down the, um, the exact theorem that we, that we have because I'm not sure that it's, uh, uh, it doesn't really fall into the scope of what I wanted to say today. But if you want to justify the approximation, once you have constructed everything, it's just a matter of having an energy inequality. Okay, you have your actual solution, you have your approximate solution, you make the difference between the two, and you do your energy inequality, and that's it. Okay, so uh, if your approximate solution is nice enough, you're done. Okay, so the last part of this talk and of these lectures will be Ekman layers. Three Ekman layers. So in uh, my first example, I presented uh, something in which you had one boundary layer that was nice in the sense that it allowed you to lift one of the boundary conditions, and the other was not so nice, but it gave you some condition on the interior flux. The second example was, let's say, the ideal, uh, ideal case when your boundary layer allows you to lift everybody. Okay, so that's very nice. You have no uh, retraction of the boundary layer on the uh, interior uh, space, and the Ekman layer is, again, a slightly different situation. So the starting point is the rotating fluids equation. Uh, which looks like this. So it's dt u epsilon plus u epsilon grad u epsilon plus gra gradient of p epsilon plus the rotation term 
Uh, and here I will follow Rupert's advice and take a distinguished limit. So I'm linking the um, Rossby uh, number with the vertical diffusion. Okay. So this is the equation for U epsilon. U epsilon is divergence free. Uh, and that's it, okay? So it's in a, the domain omega is the two-dimensional torus times zero, one. And you have Dirichlet boundary conditions on the boundary. Okay? Uh, so if you... If you recall what I did yesterday, so I didn't have time to study this specific system, but if you forget about, uh, if you forget about the boundary, so let's say if omega were the three-dimensional torus, then this would exactly fall into uh, the scope of what I told you about yesterday, okay? You have a penalization operator, which is the Coriolis operator, so let's call K the space U in L2 of omega uh, with uh, three components, such that U is divergence free. And since U is divergence free, you can enforce, even if U is in L2, a bit of boundary conditions on U because you can, uh, you can require that U satisfies non-penetration boundary conditions on the boundary, okay? So I can assume that u3 at z equals one equals u3 at z equals zero equals zero. Okay, so this is uh, the space in which my functions live. Okay, p is the orthogonal projection on 2k. And I will denote by l the projection of the rotation term, okay? And so uh, if you want to write the equation in a more compact way and you forget briefly about the nonlinear term, your penalization operator would be exactly one over epsilon L, right? Uh, so if you remember what I uh, talked about yesterday, what you can do is find a basis of eigenvectors of K for L. Okay, so uh, I will quote some references on this. this. There is the book by Chemin Desjardins, Gallagher and Grenier, as well as uh, works by these authors uh, previously. Uh, there are also some works by Masmoudi, by Frédéric Rousset, who is in this room, and by Babin Mahalov and Nikolaenko. who studied in particular resonances associated with L. Okay, but I won't be talking about these resonances today. Uh, so there are a lot of people here that I'm not quoting. I just try to give you some. Uh, general references if you were interested in the study of this system, okay? I find that uh, this book is very complete and very, uh, very nice to read. Um, okay, so the uh, a natural step, let's say, is to, uh, given yesterday's lecture, is to look for U epsilon, epsilon uh, let's say as a sum as a u epsilon equals exponential uh, minus t over l v epsilon of t and v epsilon of t will be a sum over k of b epsilon k of t times n k and n k is an eigenvector 
of L. Okay, so in fact, you do, you can do such a thing. You have a, a lemma uh, which tells you that you have uh, L and K equals I lambda K and K, and uh, lambda K is I, so pi K3, uh, pi K3, over the square root of K, h squared plus pi k3 squared, okay? And nk, I'm not uh, uh, writing down explicitly what it is, but it has the following form. So there is this uh, Fourier phase, and then it's nh of k times so cosine pi k3 z and n3 of k times the sine of pi k3 z. So as you can see, each of the n k's vanishes for z equals zero and z equals one, okay, because you have a sine, okay? Um, so this is very natural in the spirit of what I did yesterday, but obviously what you see is that the n k's, the, their horizontal part does not vanish on z equals zero and z equals one, because you have a cosine, so it's either plus or minus one, but it's not zero, okay? So you, what you have is boundary layers in the vicinity of z equals zero and z equals one to lift the, the horizontal trace of, uh, of these NKs, okay? Uh, so if you want to construct a, an approximate solution, this is a nice, this is a good first step, but then you need to look at the boundary layers uh, in the vicinity of z equals zero and z equals one in order to, um, to lift the uh, defect in the horizontal trace. So this is what I will, uh, these boundary layers are called Ekman layers. And I will now go into their study. Okay, so the problem is that um, nkh at z equals zero and z equals one is non-zero. So you have boundary layers close to z equals zero and z equals one to lift the uh, horizontal trace. Okay, so once again, this is linked to the fact that you, um, one over epsilon L minus the diffusion operator is not a nor normal operator, okay? This is why you have these, uh, these boundary layers and this is why these, uh, this filtering method doesn't work in one step. Um, so, let's, say, let's look at the study of boundary layers, say, uh, close to z equals zero. So it's the same for uh, close to z equals one, but uh, only uh, you, you need to replace uh, z by, by one minus z. Okay. Uh, so you look for a solution. of the linear part of the Navier-Stokes, uh, did I write what a name? So this is Navier-Stokes Coriolis, okay? Of the Navier-Stokes Coriolis system in the form Uh, exponential i, so it will be kh xh minus omega t over epsilon. Here I meant, uh, uh, as you can see, 
I will have oscillations at frequencies lambda k uh, over epsilon, okay? And so I'm uh, anticipating this, and I'm already putting an omega over epsilon in my phase, okay? Um, minus, uh, minus lambda z times uh, u p, okay? And this, uh, so it's a four-dimensional vector. Okay, so you plug this into your system, and once again, you do this linear algebra. So now, I guess that you are becoming uh, familiar with it, so I don't, will not write down the, the whole thing. Um, maybe one, one thing that uh, I might want to stress here is that sometimes when you uh, look at how it's done in textbooks, and for instance, uh, in the book by Chemin, Desjardins, Gallagher, and Grenier, they um, drop some terms from the very, very beginning. For instance, they will tell you the pressure doesn't vary in the boundary layer, and so we don't take into account the pressure, okay? I'm not doing that here. I'm keeping everybody, okay? You keep everybody, and afterwards, you check that you, you, you indeed can neglect the pressure and so on. But actually, in some cases, it's not legitimate to neglect the pressure, and the pressure terms have some importance. So I will uh, try to explain that now, but um, uh, let, let's say that the only drawback to, uh, to keeping everybody is that you have to study a four, uh, maybe a, yeah, you need to study a four by four system instead of a two by two one, okay? So it's a little more technical, but it's not the end of the world. I mean, we are uh, able to do that. So, uh, so I, uh, my advice is that as long as, so at least in the beginning, you keep everybody, and then you make the simplifications that you that seem legitimate, but uh, don't assume anything a priori. Okay, so once again, you get a linear system. Uh, A epsilon, so I will try to be consistent with uh, my previous notations, capital U epsilon, capital P epsilon equals zero. Okay, you will get some, uh, and the uh, determinant of capital A epsilon is a polynomial of, uh, so actually, it's a polynomial of degree, the best way to look at it, it's a polynomial of degree three in lambda square. Okay, so it's actually a polynomial of degree six in lambda, but as soon as lambda is a solution, minus lambda is also a solution. So when you want to look at uh, solutions with positive real part, it's kind of convenient to, see, uh, to, to write it in this way. Uh, and so you can investigate the roots of A epsilon, and I, uh, once again, I will distinguish between some regimes. Uh, you will need to write it in a more, uh, I cannot write it in this uh, horizontal way, so let me walk you through some regimes. So the regime number one is the most classical one. So it's the case where kh is non-zero and omega is less than one. In that case, you have two roots uh, lambda with positive real part. And uh, of order uh, epsilon to the minus one. Okay, so these are classical Ekman layers. Okay. And you also have one root uh, for the, uh, for, of positive real part, which is a further one. Okay, so this one does not correspond to a boundary layer, okay? Uh, so usually I think people don't really compute it. But uh, let, let me say this right now in case I forget uh, about it in the end. Uh, so I will uh, explain at uh, the very end how you construct the interaction with the classical Ekman layers with, uh, with the mean flow, okay? So, and, uh, and this is really a, 
step-by-step -step construction, so, uh, as you will see. So the important thing here is that since you don't have three routes and you only have two, uh, the construction of two boundary layers that will lift your horizontal, uh, the, the horizontal part of, the, of, the, of N, uh, NKH, this will create a defect in the vertical part, okay? You have no choice, actually, okay? You, you have 3D vectors. If you impose two boundary conditions, then you, you, you need to, uh, to have some defect elsewhere. And because of the divergence free condition, the defect that you're creating on the vertical uh, trace is of order epsilon, okay? So it's small, but it's non-zero, okay? And this is really linked to the fact that you only have two roots. If you had three, you wouldn't have a problem. Okay, and so since you have this defect in the vertical part, what you do next is construct some corrector. Uh, this corrector will be a order epsilon, so it's small, but as you can see, you have a penalization, and it's also oscillating, so its, its uh, contribution to the mean flow is of order one, because it's of order epsilon. You divide it by epsilon when you insert it into the equation, and so it, it has a an order one contribution to the mean flow, okay? And this is precisely what is called Ekman pumping. Now, what I wanted to say is the following. So this is a possible construction. It's the one that is done in textbooks. You could also try to do a different construction, actually, which would be uh, to keep all three roots, including the one that is of order one, okay? So in that case, you lift the three boundary conditions. You really have something that is a of, um, uh, that has zero trace, okay? Uh, quite possibly what you find is that the amplitude of uh, the, this thing here with positive real part is, uh, is of order epsilon. So obviously you need to be careful because you need to do that on two sides. And, uh, and so the two sides need to be matched because the, the trace of this false boundary layer close to z equals zero is not small on the other boundary, okay? So you have a kind of coupling of the two boundaries through these, uh, let's say, degenerate boundary layers, okay? But in theory, at least, it's doable. And so the question is, uh, can you retrieve the, 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 um, the usual Ekman pumping through this construction Okay, which is maybe a little more theoretical, but which doesn't need to go through different steps. So I tried to do it this week and I wasn't quite sure that it worked, so I, I, it's, really a, it's really an open question, okay? So it, uh, I, I'm not sure it's uh, that hard and I'm not sure it works, uh, but I think it would be a nice other point of view of the construction of the uh, Ekman pumping. Uh, in any case, so there is a second regime. So there is regime number two, in which you have kh, which is non-zero, and omega, which is equal to one. Okay, so this is somewhat uh, artificial because it doesn't really exist. Uh, you see, if you have a kh that is non-zero, lambda k here is always smaller than one. Okay, uh, and there's no i here. But, uh, but okay, let's uh, look at it at least for a, a, a theoretical point of view, and it also gives you some insight as to what happens when K3 is very large. And in that case, you have one classical Ekman layer. Okay, so one root with a positive real part. Layer, so which is uh, like epsilon to the minus one. And in fact, you have two roots of order epsilon to the minus one half, uh, but with positive real part. Oh, 
Okay? So in some way, if you look at the whole parameter regime, as omega goes close to one, one of your classical Ekman layers and this root of positive real part will both become uh, something that is of order epsilon to the minus one half. Okay? And in that case, so you have one, two, three boundary conditions, you can lift everything. So you can keep uh, uh, zero trace for the, for the vertical component while lifting the, boundary, the horizontal boundary condition. So in that case, you have no Ekman pumping. Okay, so this is something that we did with Laure Saint-Raymond and we call those quasi-resonant Ekman layers. Okay, then you have uh, num uh, regime number three, which is the case when you have kh equals zero and omega equals one. So you have, in that case, two classical Ekman layers. And one root, which is exactly zero. Okay, so you cannot do anything with that one. But actually, since kh is zero, it's, uh, it's not so bad because the vertical component is always zero because of the divergence free condition. Okay, so in that case, you really need to lift only two boundary conditions, and this is what you're able to do, and so you're fine. Okay? So this was regime number three, and the last one is regime number four. Which is kh equals zero and uh, omega strictly less than one. Ah, no, this, this was omega strictly less than one, sorry. Omega equals one, and in that case, you have one classical Ekman layer. And uh, exactly two, two roots are exactly zero. And in that case, since you have exactly two zero roots, the method more or less fails. Okay, you can only lift one boundary condition, and for the rest of the boundary conditions, you cannot apply this. So you need to do something else. Essentially, what you need to do is construct boundary layers for the heat equation. Okay, so the, the boundary layers that you obtain in that case are really the ones for the heat equation. Okay, so uh, maybe in the one last minute, let me focus on uh, regime number one, and uh, I will uh, just write very briefly what I said earlier. So in regime number one, the classical construction is the following. So introduce, you introduce a boundary layer uh, lifting the horizontal trace of the interior solution. Okay, once again, since you can only lift two boundary conditions and not three, uh, you will get a defect uh, for the trace of the vertical component. So you get a defect of order epsilon on the vertical component. Okay, you lift this defect thanks to a corrector. Thanks 
to a corrector. So let's say uh, U lift, which is a further epsilon. What do I mean here? So the conditions on your uh, corrector are the following. It needs to satisfy some specific boundary, uh, Dirichlet boundary condition on this uh, vertical component, and it needs to be divergence free. And essentially that's it, okay? So you construct anything that is divergence free and that has the correct vertical traces at z equals zero and z equals one, okay? But so you have a whole, uh, a lot of degrees of freedom, but in the end, they all give you the same result, okay? And then you look at uh, dt of u lift plus one over epsilon L of u lift, okay? And you project this, uh, okay? And this will be a further one. Okay, and this gives you a source term in the equation, in the limit equation for V epsilon, okay? And the important thing is that this source term, so it's a further one, and it's a pumping term, so it's, a, it's like a friction term. It will uh, generate a decay of your L2 norm, okay? So the rotation, uh, through the, the interaction between the rotation and the, the, the boundary layer creates some dissipation at order one, okay? This is the uh, important part. So as you can see, you have a, again a very uh, different regime here because you, when you construct the boundary layers, these boundary layers have a retroaction on the interior boundary through this ekman pumpinger term. So it gives you a third example of the typical behavior that boundary layers can have. So actually I'm just saying typical, but there is nothing very typical about it. The, the, the construction is uh, always the same, but then the effect that the boundary layers can have is very diverse. And it's really a case by case analysis. So I will stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. Some questions? Any question? Okay. So we may thank again Anna and um, also thank all the, uh, the, the participants and lecturers <laughs> for being there. Thank well, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's my role to also <laughs> say thank you to the organizers for uh, putting together such a nice, uh, nice event. I had a lot of pleasure being here. So uh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>